What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is March 19th of 2019. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are. And today I wanna to spend a decent amount of time to talk about something that's not only very important to understand, but very fundamental to all markets abroad. It really doesn't matter if you just trade or invest in cryptocurrencies, equities, commodities, fixed income markets like bonds or treasuries or Forex. This is something that is fundamental to all markets, but it's gonna be very apparent through the first thing that we're gonna talk about, and that is just how impactful central banks can be. And in that impact, we learn how central banks can move markets and what really drives markets abroad in general. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you one of those things right away, guys. I'm not going to drag you on throughout the video. I want to let you all know what really drives markets. And it's not talked about enough. You know, we talk about indicators and fundamental factors. But the biggest thing that really drives markets up or down, what leads to booms and busts, is inflows and outflows of capital. If the macro environment, uh, you know, the bigger picture overall in the global economy is setting up for a scenario for money to move into markets, to take risk, that is obviously going to lead to valuations rising and vice versa, right? If things are starting to turn back, if, uh, you know, certain macro factors are coming into play that make it seem like it's not a good time to buy equities, maybe equities are a little overextended, then you'll see price corrections, right? Usually every boom comes to the bust. It's a credit cycle. Well, in this case, we're really focusing in on monetary policy, and I'm gonna talk about why it's the most important. So take a look at this chart here. This was Q1 of 2019, all right? So this is really the past three months. Uh, we're not done with March just yet, but pretty much the bulk of the past three months of price action for the Shanghai Composite, one of the largest indexes in Asia. Well, we can see here, I have marked on the chart the first trading day of January down here, where we are looking to potentially break down the lows here for um, the Shanghai Composite and continue lower. We've already been on a very long extended downturn on this uh, for the longer term. And we can see here over the past, really the past two months, uh, we've been kind of hovering around here for the early part of March, that we saw a 22% leap in the Shanghai Composite in two months, two months, 22 to 23% absolutely stunning especially in this market where things have been slowly grinding down well what led to that right was there some indicator that we should have spotted was there you know uh, did president Xi announce some big you know construction plan to stimulate the chinese economy what did he do right and, you know or maybe did we reach a trade deal agreement right it has nothing to do with any of those let's take a look at the central bank balance sheets and what would you know right here Again, we're talking about January, so you have to ignore the month, uh, the current month here. Take a look at the big little bump there. It might not seem like much that you, we see on the chart here on the, um, the People's Bank of China balance sheet here. This is the Central Bank of China. See that bump there? Well, that bump was in January, and that bump in January happened to be one of the largest credit creation periods in Chinese history. In fact, it was the largest month of new yuan loans, the Chinese yuan, the currency of the nation, the largest net amount of new loans created in a single month in history. You can see it on the chart here. Uh, take a look at the past 10 years. It tends to be sometimes in January that China creates a bunch of capital, but this one took the books. This was the highest one in history. And we've been seeing that in Asia predominantly, but abroad in the world, central banks have been really on a weak limb trying to stimulate the economy at these highs. Because as markets grow higher, they need more capital because equities are more expensive. And also there's more of an incentive to sell at these levels to start locking in profits. So as economies start to slow down, central banks actually need to step in more. And that's exactly what's happened here in the Shanghai Composite. But China's not alone. I'm not here to ramble or rant on China. You can take a look across the board. This is the case for the Nikkei as well. Um, the major uh, index in China, or excuse me, in Japan, my apologies. If we take a look here, it's taking a second to load. We can see the same exact period right here during the end of December rallying upwards. Definitely not as strong at percentage wise as China and the Shanghai Composite, but we can see it as well with the Hong Kong uh, 33 as well. So I'll go ahead and pull up the index. It's taking a second to load here. You can see, again, strong rebound off these levels right at a time, again, where it was looking like we'd break down lower because the central bank stepped in. And again, U.S. equities are actually just as guilty. We're up 24 to 25%. I mean, this is incredible stuff. Right as we had broken through a downward channel, very extremely bearish pattern, what changed? It was the monetary policy. See, when you have so many factors coming in, 
there was a big restructuring of, of like a $64 billion restructure from money moving out of fixed income markets to equities. Uh, when you have the central bank of the United States saying that we're going to hold back raising interest rates, and there's another decision coming up here soon from uh, Fed Chairman Powell, probably today or tomorrow, that we'll see whether or not they continue to raise rates. But when you start to set up that environment and say that you're willing to stop the roll off of the balance sheet, aka the central bank will stop selling its assets on its books, then you start to provide relief. You provide an environment that surprises people and makes them incentivized to start buying up equities. Should you fight that system? No, you shouldn't, guys. Understand that it is important to play along with what the, the central banks are doing in that case. And the reason I say that is because if you fight against the tide of incentives, the market's going to wreck you in this case. Now, when those tides change, that is when we can start to change our outlook, right? It's all a matter of watching what central banks do. And boy, have central banks gotten themselves in a mess. Uh, the Bank of Japan, for example, is a top 10 shareholder in 40% of Japan's listed companies. This is back all the way in 2018, and it still holds true. They have been continuing to ramp up their, um, their purchase, not only of individual shares in companies, but they are one of the largest ETF buyers in, uh, in Japan in total. Now, one thing to take into mind, this is an article that just came out the other day where the Bank of Japan has its lowest spree of buying ETFs. But <laughs> bear in mind, in this, in this case, uh, over the last four days, they've bought $631 million of ETFs for the Japanese markets. And that may not seem like much on the macro scale, but this is over a four-day course. And along with that, these markets are much smaller, right? We have to understand the size of the Japanese market. It's about $5 trillion, whereas if we were to go up here real quick and take a look at the New York Stock Exchange, we have a much different size. Let me see if I can actually get, I think U.S. markets are down here. Yeah, $18.4 So you're dealing with very vastly different valued equity markets. And if you want to actually see the scale here, and again, go back to what, the, uh, what time period we were talking about in December, you can see here that we had a major creation of 800 billion uh, yuan there, right there. Uh, again, huge stimulus here. You can pretty much divide that by 111 because that's the ratio of a dollar to the Chinese, or sorry, the Japanese yuan or Japanese yen. Sorry, I mix those two up. They sound so similar. But last year, um, you know, we were at a record 6.5 trillion yen in ETFs last year for J the Japanese uh, central bank, the Bank of uh, Japan. So they're continuing to stimulate their economy. They're not stopping. It's it's very important to understand just how much buying activity that is. I think last year they have a figure down here. Let's see if I can get it. Um, if we basically, if you were to to take this number here, six point five uh, trillion yen in this case, you're talking about um, in this case, you know. I think it's around like 58 to 60 billion US dollars in central bank buying activity just on the ETFs. We're not talking about the purchases of stocks. We're not talking about the purchases of fixed income markets like bonds and treasuries. We're just simply talking about the assets. Japan's kind of unique in this sense. They're the ones who are really buying up assets in this case, like stocks. Um, and and this, is, this is the one thing to take away here, these two quotes sent here. On March 6th, the Bank of Japan board member Yutaka Harada said that if risks to uh, Japan's economy materialize or a hit to price growth proves to not be temporary, the Bank, the bank of Japan wouldn't hesitate to step in. So they may not even be done. If markets even think about dipping, they're going to continue stepping in. Japan's economic sentiment is worsening, and some BOJ board members are voicing that they won't hesitate to take action, Fujito said. If the global equities market becomes volatile again, if it sells off slightly, the Bank of Japan may have a little choice but to increase its ETF target as its next policy step. So just keep pouring alcohol into the punch bowl, guys. Party can't end. And this is the, the, the thing that I think a lot of people think is that this can just go on forever. And it can go on much longer than most people think. In fact, it has gone on for very long before in history. This is a great documentary that I recommend you guys. I talked about it like months back when I actually watched it. This is called The Princes of the Yen. And it talks about how Japan built up one of the largest asset booms in history. It was a major experiment with monetary policy where certain properties of land uh, cost it pretty much, <laughs> I can't remember the the uh, kind of flagship uh, ones, but there was there was ridiculous levels of real estate value. And some of them were, were, were just so apparent that you, you almost wanted to slap yourself across the face. It was so obvious. But the major thing to take away from this is that history is going to repeat itself. And these bubbles can last for a very, very long time. But eventually, you have to pull things back. And there's a reason for that. And it has to do with the fact that these guys, as much as they play the same game, as much as they're 
propping up currencies, you know, in a very similar way, they are competing. They're competing within an agreed upon framework established by the Bank of International Settlements, the IMF, and the World Bank. And that is a competition of currencies. The one market that a lot of people don't focus on that has a lot to do with central banks is forex markets, the value of currencies. If the dollar gains 10% to the euro, the immense amount of purchasing power I've just gained against the European economy is huge, and vice versa. And that's why central banks have to find a tethered balance between keeping equity markets high and keeping the value of their currency high. And that's what Powell's trying to do. He's playing tango with both sides. He's trying to please both parties. And you can take a look here. If we take a look at the Dixie, which is or the DXY, which is the dollar index, uh, which kind of weights it amongst most currencies in the world, we can see that the DXY, uh, you know, really through 2018 and 2019, uh, has been rising pretty steadily. You know, we've gone up a decent amount, and it seems like we're starting to pick up this parabolic trend where the market is expecting you know, higher levels here at a faster rate. You can see we're almost seeing this parabolic trend here that I, I've been pointing out for a little while. Now, can it keep up with that pace? That's the question. Can we keep equity markets high? We just got a big 22 to 23% boost. Can we keep the dollar up as well? I'll be honest, guys. I don't think Powell, uh, you know, it's expected. It's like a 30% bet that he's going to raise rates. I really don't see Powell raising rates. And I think the reason why is because uh, of just how harsh we saw equities go down back in December. And in this case, you're probably going to see the DXY come down and, and break out of this trend and probably come back down to $94, right? And that, you know, it's a measurement of what's more beneficial. Is it beneficial keeping up equities up the 20 something percent they went up this past, past month? Um, you know, or do we want the dollar to be holding its value and going up higher, maybe towards 100 on the index? That's the balance there. That's the question. And central banks, it's crazy how much responsibility they hold, guys. But it's important as a trader to just understand what it is and take it as what it is and to apply it to your trading strategy. So again, my, my important lesson here in all of this, guys, is again, no matter where you are, uh, no matter what markets you're trading, to take away that key lesson we talked about at the beginning, markets are inflows and outflows. When it comes to cryptocurrencies, altcoins and Bitcoin and all these cryptocurrencies in general, when they move up, it is because there's more inflows coming in. They are slamming through the order book. And when things get too high, when the disincentive, um, you know, there's when there's uh, you're disincentivized to continue speculating or things have gotten too overextended, it's a matter of outflows leading price down, right? When there's too much weight one way or the other through the order book. And that's apparent in every single market. In this case, more specifically, we're focusing on equities, we're focusing on stocks, and that balance of central banks managing both. So I'd like to know what you guys think down below in the comments. What do you think about all of this? Do you apply it to your trading strategy? Do you keep an eye on you know, the growth in central bank assets? I mean, we can take a look here. I think uh, this is the uh, total assets of the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan. Again, interestingly enough, right when that downtrend stops, we tend to see equities rising. It's a simple game of inflows and outflows. Anyways, that's it for the video. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this kind of macro analysis on markets. I know I've been uh, kind of cutting down a little bit on the trading on stocks and equities and things of that sort. But if you'd like to see more of it, I'll be sure to make some time to do some videos on it as well. But until the next one, guys, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all are having a fantastic day, and I'll see you all in the next one. Stay tuned.